I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's joined our healing service today. It's a great pleasure and privilege to have you here. So welcome. Today is a particular special day for our healing service because it's World Environment Day. And World Environment Day, which takes place on this year, each year since 1972, is an opportunity for all of us to reflect on how important the environment is to each of us. Our food that we eat, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the climate that we live in is all nature. And so in this healing service, it will give us an opportunity to reflect on the healing power of nature too. So for this World Environment Day Healing Service, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers who in their own way represent people from around the globe, which is very important on this day. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Penny Hayward. Penny is a diploma holder of the Spiritualist National Union and a medium. So welcome, Penny. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce to you Tim Smith, also a diploma holder of the Spiritualist National Union. And thank you for joining us, Tim. Tim is a healing medium, and I know that healing is a very important aspect of Tim's life as a spiritualist. I'd like to introduce you to Tanya Smith, and Tanya, many of you will know, is the general manager of the Arthur Findlay College at Stansted. And Tanya, in her career at the college, has welcomed people from all around the globe. And of course, those of you who know the college will know that it sits within nature in such a beautiful landscape. So thank you for joining us, Tanya. I'd also like to introduce you to Mark Lanehart, who joins us from America. It's very good to have you here representing spiritualism. Welcome, Mark. I'd also like to introduce you to David Schieser. David is a diploma holder of the Spiritualist National Union, and those of you who joined us last week will remember David held our healing service last week too. So thank you for joining us again. And finally, I would like to introduce you to Mia Otterson. Welcome Mia, and Mia is a certificate holder of the Spiritualist National Union. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to all our speakers. So shall we begin with our opening prayer? So I'm going to invite Penny to unite us all in that attitude of prayer. Thank you, Alv. If you'd all like to just join me by either closing your eyes or perhaps bowing your heads just for a few moments as we just connect each other together in this virtual forum. Father God, the divine spark of life within us all. We are gathered together on this auspicious occasion where we honour the earth, we honour the environment of this beautiful planet that we live on. And we remind ourselves of the beauty and the power of this planet. We remind ourselves of that spark of God that is within each one of us and within all life, including this planet we live. We ask at this time that the world of spirit, which is also a part of our environment, gathers ever closer to us to inspire us and to work with us upon our healing thoughts as we send out our vibration of love and healing to each other and the world in which we live. 
let us be together in this time and space and also for those who may watch this at a later time know that you are still a part of this special service and that you will continue to carry the thoughts and prayers as you review this at another time. Let us remind ourselves that nature runs within us all as nature is a part of our world and that without our beautiful planet and the environment in which we live, perhaps it would be an unusual place to be. We've been through some difficult times and I'm sure that we appreciate our environment all the more as we start to emerge from our place of retreat and isolation. And we leave this service in your care and keeping as we allow the healing and inspiration to move forward. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Penny, for that prayer and for bringing us into that healing power. As you know, within Spiritualism, we take our inspiration from many sources. And for the next part of our service, I'm going to invite Tim to share with you some words from a reading that he's chosen for you. Tim. Hello, everybody. Um, this one is called Ethical and Green Living. It's by a, um, a chap called Kumar, and he describes himself as a green environmental activist. But actually, the thought he comes up with, I felt, was very, very relevant to us as spiritualists. So forgive me as I look down, but I'll read this to you. It's really very good. He begins, what part does spirituality play in the green movement? Is the environmental debate to be centered around emissions targets and fear, or whether concepts such as love and reverence for nature can give us a positive attitude and inspire us to live in harmony with the planet. Today, I have no doubt about the nature of the problem affecting humanity. That is a lack of reverence and compassion for nature. This important element, once seen as crucial to the environmental debate, seems to have been left by the wayside in all the talk of emissions targets, carbon footprints, and impending doom. Hippies were fond of speaking of Gaia, Mother Earth, and the Earth mind as a living organism. But as the environmental debate eventually reached the ears of politicians and scientists, it moved away from talk of spirituality and began to concentrate solely on a rational scientific analysis of the effects of climate change. All around are dire warnings about minim, imminent catastrophe, with targets set in line with the wishes of major corporations. But no one seems to want to talk about the essence of respect for nature, which stems from internal human qualities that are difficult to quantify, but far more relevant to the debate. Reverence for nature and terms such as spirituality seem irrelevant and even offensive to those who wish to think in pragmatic terms. The role of materialistic science sees nature, nature in purely quantifiable terms and economic realism takes precedent over any supposed wishy-washy notions of spiritual connection with the planet. I am really shocked by this. Look at what realists have done for us. They have led us to war and climate change, poverty on an unimaginable scale and wholesale ecological destruction. Half of humanity goes to bed hungry because of all the realistic leaders in the world. I tell people who call me unrealistic to show me what their realism has done. Realism is an undoubted, overplayed and wholly exaggerated co concept. This unwillingness to acknowledge the spiritual aspect of the debate, however nebulous it seems in purely scientific terms, leads us to view nature 
as the industrials view it, viewed it in the 19th century, as something to be controlled and conquered. Now that our scientific knowledge has alerted us to the fact that this is an impossible task, it has led us to this state of anxiety about what this unconquerable force will do to us next. The trouble is we are driven by fear and so we take panic decisions like opting for nuclear power. At the moment, our culture is of violence, violence to nature, animals, people, and ourselves. We are not protecting nature these days so much as managing it without knowing it. If you want to protect it, go out in it. But in order for this spiritual view to become commonplace, and for the environmental debate to take on a positive message of spiritual connection and reverence for nature, science itself must acknowledge what those of us who live constantly with nature are only too aware of, that the relationship between humanity and the natural world contains an element that cannot be quantified, but which is crucial to our species moving away from the prioritizing of economic concerns over qualities of love and compassion. Economics must be put in its place. Imagination should be at the forefront of our environmental thinking. At what point do we stop our fear and anxiety over what nature will do to us and accept that spirituality is crucial to how we tackle environmental destruction, war and violence and create a better world to live in? Or we can meekly stand back and have governments and scientists reel out statistics and targets and ignore the spiritual aspects of life itself. The choice, as they say, is entirely in your hands. Thank you for listening. I think he was a hippie as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tim. What an incredible reading and a, a huge reminder that as people who are aiming to live a spiritual lives, a life of spirituality, it places us with that responsibility. And I think that's an important challenge that we must all take to. Thank you, Tim. So I'm now going to introduce you to Penny again, who will share some thoughts with you along with the rest of the speakers. Penny. Thanks, Al. So today we thought for World Environment Day, it would be a change to try and have a relay of speakers to put our thoughts from different perspectives from around the world about the environment and connect that with healing as well. In our lineup, we have a few different representations from around the world. For myself, I was born in Australia and spent just over half my life there before I came to England. So today I'd like to represent Australasia. And on the team of speakers, we have Tanya, who is the manager of the Arthur Finlay College, as Elf mentioned. And while the college sits in our beautiful country, England, where we are, it actually is a home to people from all over the world. People from every country and every walk of life, or almost every country, and certainly every walk of life, come to the college. They're drawn there from all areas of the world to experience their own spiritual awakening, to further their knowledge and understanding of their abilities and spiritualism. We and those that have visited the college know that it sits within a wonderful garden, a beautiful environment. And I know that Tanya will talk more to you about that. We also have Mia and David who are from different parts of Europe 
and they will br bring their flavor and their essence and their inspiration from different parts of Europe. We also have Mark, who is representing America or the Americas, and we will hear his thoughts and inspiration to do with the environment and connect that to healing. And within this forum, we, I would like to just talk to you a little bit about Arthur Finlay, because of course I'll be handing over to Tanya who is sitting in, it's not a virtual screen, but she is sitting in the Arthur Finlay College. And because of the virus, we're unable to visit there, but that was Arthur's home with his wife, Gertrude. And reading through his book, Looking Back, Arthur talks about many things, including when and how he came to move to Stansted Hall, as we know as Arthur Finlay College. And he talked about some of his spiritual experiences. And he had the opportunity to sit with a trance medium and speak to the spirit world. And one of his discoveries, Arthur's discoveries, was that the spirit world were able to read our thoughts through images. He found, and I have his book here, where he says, thus I found from them, meaning the spirits, that our thoughts are mental images our minds picturing everything we think and do. Now that's a rather profound thing to absorb into your consciousness. But I'd like to ask you to think about this planet, to think about the environment in which you're in, whether it be in the present moment or on a recording, to picture the world and the earth being environment day, and to know that your thoughts in holding this beautiful planet in your thoughts will send that healing from the spirit world. So as we hear those thoughts of inspiration from each speaker, hold the college, hold the planet, hold each country within your thoughts and minds and send that positive power as we try to empower this world in which we live. So allow me now to hand over to Tanya so that we can hear a little more about Arthur's home and the place that we now call our second home. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Penny, and uh, uh, hello to everybody from the heart of the Arthur Finley College. So tonight, I thought I'd like to share with you some of the initiatives that are happening uh, within the college and externally to, uh, to help our global matter with regards to the environmental uh, survival of both of ourselves and the world. So some of the initiatives that go on in, the, in this college, first and foremost, it under, against contrary belief, we have a recycling program that goes on in conjunction with our local council. So all of our rubbish is now recycled, which is wonderful news because we've been battling for years to have that happen. We also have initiatives in place with regards to making all of our um, products within the college environmentally friendly, such as chemicals that we use to clean the premises. Now, with regards to the building, um, we've been, as some, many of you that have visited recently, we have many um, refurbishment programs that have been underway and currently ongoing. And with regards to the products that we use, we're pleased to report that most, well, all of our paint is now environmentally friendly. All of the replacements of the bathrooms, we've been using sustainable, um, environmentally friendly materials and using, of course, the natural products of wood in the construction. Just pleased to tell you that within the, the building, we we'll certainly look at any opportunity to take environmentally products forward into our business. In addition, you wouldn't believe the amount of bulbs, of course, that this building has to consume 
with um, giving shedding light around the building for you all. And our bulbs, some of them, when we were looking at them and replacing them, they were over 110 watts, just the light corridors. And I'm really pleased to tell you that those bulbs have now been replaced and they're just 11 watts. Most of the bulbs around here now are three watt bulbs, but produce even more light than they, um, they did in the, in the beginning. So it's a great, great change supporting our environmental problem. Now externally, outside the college, is even more wonderful things happening still. Because outside in our beautiful grounds stand a great many trees. Now there are 776 beautiful trees in the garden and that are mature trees. Now of course those trees very much support the, the wildlife and I'm really thrilled to tell you that we've got red kites nesting in the grounds, we have buzzards, we have newts and lots of other beautiful British wildlife that um, are all around and believe you me they've been thriving since there's been no students here because they have a great big 38 acre plot to play in so it's been lovely to watch all of the um, activity outside so certainly our animals are enjoying that opportunity of uh, freedom and uh, unable to roam we even had deer in the garden most recently so going back to our trees um, of course the trees are really important to our environment and by calculation the, consum the, the consumption of CO2 from the trees in our garden alone um, consume 18.5 tonnes, cubic tonnes of CO2. So that's a huge contribution to our environmental impact. Now of course by default those very same trees can produce oxygen enough to support 1,460 people for two years. So that's a significant um, support to, to the global impact and helping us all breathe. And of course, not just does it help, of course, the consumption of, of CO2 and the production of oxygen, but the impact of well-being on all of us is immense. And of course, it supports um, people with asthma. So there's a great deal of beauty and, and support from our garden. Now, of course, everybody knows that beautiful, iconic tree in the middle of the garden, the tulip tree. And for those of you that have, may or may not have seen it before, it comes into full bloom in the uh, month of June, July. And I'm pleased to tell you now, right now, it's in full bloom. But I've got some very, very sad news about the tulip tree. Just recently, we have found, um, I would say, an infection in the bottom trunk, and it's literally two meters off the two feet off the floor. Now that tree, we have to have um, a scan done on the tree, and that's going to significantly cost the college a lot of money to try and help that tree survive. I don't know its fate right now. I'm sure it's not terminal. And of course, with all of you people out there, the healers amongst you, it would be great if you could send that tree some of your healing thoughts. Now the tree, the tulip tree, of course, um, by default of its size and its age, um, it produces just by itself 1.2, sorry, it consumes by itself 1.2 cubic tons of CO2 in just in a year. And of course, it provides oxygen for one person to have for two years. So that's a lot of oxygen and that tree, bless it, does so much to support our environment. So as I said, if there's any way that you could support that tree by supporting it with healing, that would be very, very much welcomed. And uh, so, I'll keep you posted. I'll certainly keep that information coming forward to you all via our official Facebook page, which is Arthur Findlay Spiritualist College, Stansted. So that's just a few of the things that are going on at the college to support the environment. 
and thank you very much for listening to me. And I'd now like to pass you across to Mark, who is now ready to speak to you, I believe, from uh, America. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tanya. And we'll definitely be sending the tulip tree a lot of healing. Uh, I've spent many uh, days and nights under that tree doing meditations, uh, traveling to England, the AFC College, as a second home. Uh, so I was uh, going to talk about a few things today. I got about five minutes to talk, uh, but I want to just say um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in this beautiful healing resting planet of ours. Uh, my name is Mark Lanehart. I'm here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, the upper left uh, part of the United States and what we call the Emerald City or Seattle, Washington. Uh, it's an honor to speak today uh, as a member of the uh, Spiritual National Union. One of the things that first drew me from America or to get on a plane and fly nine hours to the college for over a decade now uh, is the concept of nature itself, light, nature, and truth. And for me, nature is a very big connection to my spiritual path. Uh, it's, like I said, it's one of the things that first drew me to the college, but also to become a member of the SNU and how we can learn from nature. And Tanya was just talking about how the trees there at the college, just how much oxygen they produce to replace the carbon dioxide that we give off when we're there. And it's a very symbiotic relationship that we have. And I think we've been called to uh, remember uh, our connection to nature and what nature is teaching us at this current moment, uh, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in England, whether you're in Europe, uh, this has uh, impacted all of us. And I wanted to reflect back to one of the first principles in the philosophy of spiritualism, uh, which is the fatherhood of God. And as I was meditating, thinking about what I was going to say today, um, that really just kind of came into my mind uh, in talking about that every living species has its own place and purpose and has evolved in accordance with the governing laws of nature. And to me, that's just really rang true. I'm here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, one of the hiking capitals of the world. People travel to Seattle, Washington to experience the, the waterfalls, the hikes, the majestic mountains, and just a reminder of, of how we are symbiotically connected to Mother Earth, the trees, whether they're in England or whether here in, in Seattle. And Today, I just want to inspire you. I just kind of look at everybody here and just kind of move into the magic of the moment. Um, it's an honor to bring inspiration and healing and, and that ripple effect that we can do as spiritualists, uh, that light in the darkness, if you will. And just a reminder that nature is our greatest teacher, our greatest engineer, our greatest inspirer. For me, nature has been my greatest healer personally. And of course, it's our greatest friend. One of the things that really resonates with me today this morning is even just the tie that I'm wearing, the green tie, the color green, even the color that was on this uh, the poster for World Environment Day. The color green to me is very powerful. It represents a few things for me. It represents uh, communication and creativity. Uh, for those that follow color, it's also the fourth chakra or the heart chakra that connects us, one of the most important chakras that connects us from the physical world to the unseen world the spiritual world, the etheric world. And it's also the color of earth, the color of green that represents Mother Earth and the environment. When you think of the environment, you think of green. And so for me, when I think of green, I think of communication. Maya Angelou, um, here from the United States, somebody that I've followed for many years about her communication. But also creativity, I think of Andy Warhol, for those of you that follow art and creativity and what, what Andy Warhol brought to this world. The color green is really important right now for us to remember and to respect our environments. I wanted to leave you just with two words today. The first one is earth. And if we break that apart in the word earth itself, it says ear. Are we listening? Are we listening to what nature is telling us? Are we respecting to what nature is telling us? Are we engaging in that symbiotic relationship that Tanya was talking about with the trees? The second word is forest. What are you doing to get out into nature, to connect, to heal on your own spiritual journey? And if you break the word in half, it literally represents for rest. How are you getting your rest in this world, in this crazy chaotic world, especially here in the United States? Um, so I just would just leave you with this. Thank you for allowing me to speak just briefly um, as a member of the SNU. But just take the time to disconnect and pause 
so that you can make so you can make time to reconnect and heal. Uh, it's been an honor speaking with you all the way from the United States here. Um, I hope that you are well and staying safe and staying healthy and of course staying connected and most importantly uh, be kind, caring, and compassionate on this journey especially when it comes to our environment and Mother Earth. And I just uh, thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, beautiful work so far. And I have to say, it is an honor to be uh, on air, on air again. And it is even a greater honor to represent my home country, Switzerland, which is really uh, known by many as the country of lakes, mountains, uh, clean air, and high quality of life, isn't it? But what seems uh, people tend to forget is it's not really cheap to live there, nor to go on holiday in Switzerland, because everything that Switzerland has, and especially with the environment, it is thought through and um, well, it costs quite a lot of money. So normally people ask me, um, me living here in the UK now is like, don't you miss Switzerland? Why did you leave? It's such a beautiful country. And so far I always said, well, I don't actually uh, miss it at all. But since Penny has asked me to come on here and talk a little bit about the environment in Switzerland, how it is connected. I thought, you know what? I had a, a light bulb moment effect and thought, yeah, actually I miss Switzerland. Because all of a sudden I started to think about going for a hike up in the mountains. Swiss people love doing that. Or just hopping on a bicycle and ride through the countryside with specifically allocated bicycle lanes and even you could easily go for a walk and you don't have to walk along uh, the M25 which is a huge um, motorway. So Switzerland and well-being so there is the healing aspect coming back into um, looking after the environment but also the benefit that we all get from it. It is beautiful to go for a walk, not being distressed by cars. It is beautiful. I have forgotten about that. Or another aspect is in Switzerland. As I said, Switzerland is the country of lakes and rivers. We just jump in lakes with no thought. We don't think, oh, is the water contaminated? Uh, is it maybe making me ill? No, we just do it with no thought. And the water quality is absolutely fantastic. So that then brought me to investigate a little, about, uh, a little bit about the water and the water quality and the responsibility that Switzerland has to look after the water. Because there are two main rivers flowing uh, one, the Rhine, and I'm sure you all heard of that river, flows through six countries, originating in Switzerland. So if we were just thinking we're on our own and we don't care what we put into this water, well, what would you think a, a country like Austria, Germany, or others would feel about that. So there is our fifth principle, personal responsibility. How do we deal with resources? What other people or countries are affected by it? Just because we're an island here in the UK doesn't mean our deeds don't have consequences and it is fascinating and I'll, I'd like you to listen to a Cree proverb and I know you all heard that before just as a reminder it's like 
It says, only when the last tree has died, the last river been poisoned, and the last fish been caught, will we realize we cannot eat money? Well, what would happen if the last tree has died? We wouldn't breathe. We wouldn't eat. So is it not up to ourselves to start changing? To maybe also think about to spend a little bit more money for organic food. Think about how much we buy. I mean, COVID pandemic has shown the shelves were empty. And a week later, the bins were full. People didn't have food to feed their families. That's what happened. And this has direct influence upon our health. And there is where our healing not only has to be mentally sent out, but also as Judy Seaman always tends to say, spirit in action. What are we doing to make this world a better place? A prayer is good, but in my opinion, it is not good enough. So personal responsibility, as I mentioned in the beginning, is vital. What are you willing to change or to maybe even give up? To find a new quality. Because it's actually quite nice not to have to worry about having too much. It is nice to just be. And I leave this thought with you to ponder about. There is no right, there is no wrong. And I'd like now to invite uh, Mia Ottesen from Sweden. And I'm very curious what she has to say. Thank you for allowing me to have those five minutes or a little bit more. Have a good day. Thank you, David. It's quite funny that I'm speaking after you because a lot of people can't separate Sweden from Switzerland. They think they are the same country. And I'm very proud to say that I think America just realized when we won the ice hockey game on the world championship against Switzerland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to have a, a little laugh about it because we all gone through a terrible time with this pandemic. But I find personally, I'm not worried. And I'm blessed to be able to put my mind on the positive things in life. And I realized over all the years of my life that worry is a state of mind that can be very, very terrifying. And yes, I'm normal. I do worry about things and I do get upset and all those things. But I also have that positive light that there must come something good from this. It must be. And I saw a poster on Facebook on Mother Earth drawn with a little virus called the Corona, the COVID-19. And Mother Earth is thanking her. Thank you for giving me a break. Well, we don't know what's going to happen when the world comes back to normality or how long it will take. I believe that people can be very selfish because it's very easy to be generous when you have a lot to give. It's very easy to be kind when you have friendly people around you. But as a spiritualist, and I hope that that goes through every spiritualist, every normal human being, that there should be a kindness, there should be a realization, especially from this terrific, horrific pandemic that we are one human race. Especially last week with the riot with the black Floyd who got killed. I mean, we are in Sweden at the moment allowed to have 50 people together. 
there were thousand people in Stockholm demonstrating for that racism, which I understand. And I can also understand the fear of the people who are afraid of the pandemic. And I don't know what's right or wrong. We can go back in history and there have been thousands and thousands who have died from pandemics. And yes, this is terrible. But I also believe, especially in Sweden, the environment I'm growing up in, I've been very safe. We have had a good economical situation over the last 50 years. We have not been able to struggle, really. We had a good social system. We have good health care. And we're quite spoiled. We are. And sometimes I think a pandemic like that or this will wake you up. I'm sorry, I, I might be blunt because I have problems to sugarcoat my English because I'm Swedish, but I always try to see that there should come something positive from it. There should be a break that maybe we realize that we're not separate, that we belong together, that we support each other. I mean, Dalai Lama, he always says, the purpose of living a life is to be happy. Well, what is happiness? How do you bring happiness into your life? Well, I certainly believe that fear will not bring happiness into anyone's life. Fear is something that really is killing the energy of joy. You have Mae West, who is an old spiritualist. She always says, you only live once, but if you do it right, right once is enough. And I believe that every one of us who are in service for the light or for the goodness, as a spiritualist, I believe in kindness and I believe in helping and caring for people. Do it right. Because in times like this, and after this pandemic crisis, they estimate that 265 millions will be in starvation. How do we help them? Yeah, it's easy to give money if you have a lot. It's easy. But if you don't, you can at least send healing. You can be a kind person. You can be positive. You can try to help them look at opportunities. I believe that every one of us is going to have an important role to spread that light and not because of the selfishness to feeling good yourself. Because I believe that this might take you out of your comfort zone to step out of your own environment where you feel safe and secure and actually sharing the light you actually are. There is another saying I want to mention. Not how long, but how well you have lived is the main thing. It's from Seneca. So how well are you living your life? And how are you treating the fellow man? And I'm so happy for this gathering where we all come together from all over the world, even if we send light, even if action speaks louder than words, at least our mind is right. We are trying to see the positive. We are trying to fill the void for someone maybe with positivity or love. I'm so sorry to hear about the tulip tree. I've been at the college since 1998 and I managed to see it in bloom for the first time last year. <laughs> and of course, healing the go. And I believe that what we've seen with this pandemic is that nature is coming back, the animals are coming back. And I can only pray that we don't destroy it once again. So all you in service, be that light, send that light to Mother Earth. Send it to the fellow beings, send it to the politicians, because they need it more than anyone, I think. Thank you, and I hand it over to Penny. Thank you, Mia. Thank you to all our speakers. And before I hand over to Alv and then Tim, who will lead us in the healing session um, today, all of our speakers have been quite passionate, so I will keep this a little brief. But I wanted to acknowledge that in Japan, there is the Shinto belief. And I hope I've said that correctly. And I apologize if I have not. But they believe that God is in nature. And 
if anyone has ever seen a Japanese garden, you will know that there is great care and respect and beauty that is put within those gardens. And the Japanese are very clever because it's not about the size of the space, it's the use of the space, no matter how big or small that may be. And there are all different types of Japanese gardens which help you to look into a void. It's sometimes not about the plants, but the space that the plants aren't in. To look into the void is to then create the space within the mind to create meditation. They also use other philosophies within these gardens, like stepping stones for contemplation or a pond as a symbol of reflection, to take time to pause, to look at what is looking back at you. Do you like what you see? Perhaps the coronavirus has given us all time to reflect, to pause, to look at what's looking back at us. And while this service is about nature and the environment, I wanted to just briefly highlight that philosophy of those gardens. And even in the very centre of London, which is a concrete jungle at the best of times, there is an exquisite Japanese garden with winding paths, maple trees, all sculpted, all beautiful, that give people that break from the hustle and bustle of life to stop, to pause, to reflect, to be at one with the nature within themselves. So as I hand back to Alv and Tim, who will lead us in a beautiful healing part of our service, let us go within and let us send out our light in our thoughts and our energy. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And thank you to all our speakers for sharing your thoughts with us. It helps us to think about different things, which helps us all to grow. And as we do that, there is healing within that too. So as Penny said, it's now time for us to have that experience of that healing energy. And to do that, I'm going to hand over to Tim, who will guide you through the next part of the service. Tim. Thank you, Alf. Now, what we're going to do now is very, very simple. And whether you're a healer, a spiritualist, a medium or not, we can all do this. And it's really a simple matter of focusing our intention and the power of our thoughts on a single purpose. And that purpose is to connect to spirit through our spirit, which we all have within us, and to create a portal which spirit can use. And together we create a great, powerful opening that spirit can use to send healing to this planet and all who live on her, because everything on this planet is aware of spirit. You may not believe it, but it's true. No matter rock, crystal, water, leaf, or living being, we are all aware of spirit in one way or another, and we're all conscious of spirit. So what I want you to do is just sit back, get comfortable, relax and take maybe a deep breath, close your eyes if you feel that helps, and focus your entire being on the purpose of opening this portal to the spirit world. And when we get there, I will just create a silence and you will know and you will feel the energy as it passes through into this world. So what I want you to do is just take that breath, relax your body and relax and you all know how to relax so let that happen and simply become aware of the spirit that's within you. And when you're aware of the spirit within you then you'll know you're connected to the spirit world and the greater whole, who is connected to Father God, the divine presence. As you focus your energy 
you'll feel the power of that growing as we join together through the power of our throats you'll feel the opening between the two worlds you'll know that you are connecting to spirit energy and the divine healing love and you'll feel that force growing now within you you feel the energy passing through your body every cell body you'll feel a wonderful glow in your heart and you'll know we've opened a portal between the two worlds we've created a cross state alignment of purpose and that purpose is one intention to heal mother earth to bring divine love and energy to repair the damage we are responsible for to to restore a true love of nature to bring that love into our hearts and the minds of all humanity make this the new normal let the energy flow through the power of our collective will feel that energy flow now while you're still within that connected spirit of energy i'd like you to send a prayer a prayer from each and every one of us a prayer to the spirit world to direct all their love and healing energy to what to me represents global spiritualism our tulip tree it's the actual center of spiritualism in this physical world so send your intention a prayer of healing from us and spirit to that living being that living entity that connects the earth and this world And now I thank you for doing that, for joining together and allowing your energy to create that portal. Now allow yourself to return 
to this physical place, this virtual joining of intention of healing and love. Come back into this place, take a deep breath, And again, I thank you for joining us. And I'm going to hand back to Penny to conclude the service. Thank you all. If you could all just try and stay a little bit in that beautiful power. As I just close this session in a prayer. Father God, the divine spark of life that moves through us all, that connects us to Mother Nature, to the power of the earth and all that live upon her. Hear our prayers, feel our thoughts, our words and feelings of healing as we send them out across the world to the tulip tree at the Arthur Finlay College, to all the parts of the world that need a little extra loving care in Australia and the Amazon, where only just last year there have been immense fires. We send our thoughts and prayers of nurture to Mother Nature, to rejuvenate, to spring forth new life, to allow this planet to bring back the lungs of the earth in the form of the trees, to allow the animal world to be able to flourish once more within Mother Nature. And let us all take within our hearts and minds the words of wisdom that has been spoken today, but also to reflect, do we need everything that we have? Can we use and reuse more wisely? Can we live more simply and happily? And can we give back to the earth in tenfold that she has given us? Amen. Amen. As we come to be closer, such a wonderful service in celebration and support of our environment around the world. I'd like to very much express gratitude to each of our speakers. To Tim. Thank you, Tim. To Penny. That's a pleasure. Thank you, Penny. To Mia. Thank you, Mia. David. Thank you, David. To Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. And to Mark. Thank you, Mark. To thank you as well at home for joining us in this service. You play a very important part. We're all part of nature ourselves. I'm reminded of that line from the Lyceum Manual, all are but parts of one stupendous whole whose body nature is and God the soul.